welcome to the stage, Mr. Tom Ford. Welcome. Here he is. The real Mr. Tom Ford. Yay. Don't sit on your microphone. Welcome. You? you can kiss me. Kiss you. Two. Thanks. You feel like you just went shopping? <laughs> I have to say, I I've interviewed some really, I've been fortunate enough to interview some really amazing people. But when I told everyone that I was interviewing you, everyone went out of control, both women and men. You would have thought I was interviewing Elvis or somebody. Even my cab driver this morning, I Elvis. told him I was interviewing you, he nearly crashed the car. Oh, you're very sweet. So you, you are a superstar for many, many different reasons. And we've just seen some of the amazing stuff that you've achieved. Before we talk about where you are now, which mm. is all of that and more, I would actually just like to go back to the beginning and ask you where you actually began. Because you've said that story to a few people, but in general, your Studio 54 days, your days at Perry Ellis, you interned at Chloe, all those things, I'd love to just ask you about that and where, where this all began. Ask Who, a question. Okay, the question where is... Where was I born? Where were you born? You were born in Texas. I was born in Texas, Austin. Then I grew up in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Then I moved to New York when I was 17 in 1979. I went to NYU. Uh, I dropped out because I was just going to nightclubs and not going to my classes, uh, paying the guy down the hall to write my papers. Uh, I started acting. I made television commercials mostly. That was about all I managed. Um, and uh, then I went to, I decided to go back to school. I went to Parsons, studied architecture, and then moved to Paris, uh, did a year at Parsons in Paris, and then uh, had an internship at Chloe uh, just after Karl Lagerfeld had left. And uh, um, uh, there was a great guy there called Peter O'Brien, and worked there and realized that actually fashion was what I loved. and. Uh, architecture was quite serious, and um, so I went back to New York, uh, graduated with a degree in architecture from Parsons, or they called it environmental design at the time, because I couldn't change, I would have had to go back and start all over. Went to 7th Avenue, knocked on doors, kind of lied because I could draw and I had a portfolio of, of fashion, and said I just graduated from Parsons, here's my portfolio, never bothered to say it was in architecture and not uh, fashion and got my first job with a wonderful woman called Kathy Hardwick on 7th Avenue in New York. And when you, before all that began, when you were a child, what's your earliest memory of you admiring fashion and who was it on? Is your mother quite a style icon for you? Or no, my style? grandmother was, uh, you know, I in Texas, everything is big, big hair, big jewelry, big cars. And my grandmother was probably, in real life, if I were to actually look back at her, a bit like a cartoon character. She was always very stylish, uh, but everything was big and overblown, very Texan. And so for me, she was my earliest memory of glamour. Uh, when she would come into our lives, she was extravagant. If she brought you a gift, she brought you six of them. And it was uh, the opposite of my parents, who were uh, a bit more um, toned down, maybe, is the word. And were you watching lots of movies and reading lots of books? Yeah, you know, you, I, I, I think life? a lot of times people ask me about why I like Los Angeles. One of the reasons I love Los Angeles is that I think I've actually had a, a kind of, and I think maybe many of you feel this way, some of the most important moments in my life in, for style, for uh, how I wanted to live, even things that people have said to each other have happened not in real reality but in film. Uh, they're, they're the things that, you know, when you're a kid growing up, you see a glamorous apartment or you see a beautiful woman or you see a handsome man or you see the way someone's living and you project that, wow, that's, that's what I want. And, and so many of those things aren't necessarily real but were images generated, uh, you know, uh, in film. Okay, so from, from your time at Chloe and um, Perry Ellis, what, what took you then to the, big, the next big jump, which was Gucci and Yves Saint Laurent, which we won't talk about too much because it's... Uh, well, I was living in New York and uh, so many of my friends had died. This was the 80s and for those of you who don't remember what it was like, uh, I mean, I, I lost so many friends in college, I would say more than half of my closest friends. And uh, Richard and I, Richard had gone through something also uh, quite tough in his life. Richard's and your partner. Just Richard, yes, uh, 27 years and we're now married, which is nice. Congratulations. And uh, thank you. Uh, Congratulations. I guess. Fantastic. Yes, thanks. Thanks. Um, I know that was just made legal in, in the UK, which is great. Uh, we were married in the States. But anyway, um, 
Uh, what were we talking about? So how you got from? I start to fall asleep during these old, like what happened to me in 19. Okay, well let's talk about what. Let's talk about. <laughs> it. But um, how did you? How did you, you? From from just a sort of mere intern, if I may, t- at Chloe, that you start becoming the head of. Well, no, no, no. no. Then I went back to school, that? and I think everyone should be an intern. By the way, I think this is a problem today. As people come out of school and they think they should immediately be a star, and in today's world, of course, you can make a sex video and you can become a star. Um, you know, if you're clever, you can get yourself. Uh, uh, you know, out in the world uh, through social media and you can become a star. But I think everyone should be an intern. You should sweep floors. You should pick up pins. If you're interested in being an architect, you know, you should run errands. You should, you should do all those things because you learn so much. Uh, so anyway, I jumped around to giving advice rather than telling you what I had done. But uh, no, I worked on 7th Avenue, which was also great because 7th, Ave- 7th Avenue in the late 80s, you know, fashion in America was always so business Oriented, and if you did, uh, uh, if you had a bad collection, you literally were escorted from the building. The next day, your collection would open. Reaction wasn't good. Someone would come and tell you, "I'm sorry, we're firing you. You let go," and you were literally taken out of the building. It never happened to me, but I wanted to make sure that it didn't happen. So you become quite aware of this is selling, that's selling, that's this much per square, you know, for, for fabrics. You're worried about the price, you're thinking about that. You're merchandising your collection as you're building it. So it was very, very useful because at that time in New York, to be a fashion designer, you had to have both a business head and a design sensibility. And I, I haven't worked in New York in 30 years, so I don't know if that's still the case, but uh, I'm afraid it's probably actually, what am I saying, it's the case more and more all over the world. Although I think now there are teams of people that do this for you. I think designers design and often merchandising teams come in and, in a sense, depersonalize things and then sell them. Because you're clearly a businessman as much as you are a creative, would you agree? You're very commercial I am. I mean, fashion for me is a commercial endeavor. It is an artistic endeavor, but I do not consider myself, as a fashion designer, an artist. Now, there are some fashion designers who are pure artists. Alexander McQueen, for me, was an artist. Uh, and that's how he expressed himself. Uh, my, the most artistic thing I have ever done, uh, which was make a film, uh, to make uh, the film that I made called A Single Man. That was a purely artistic endeavor for me uh, because I'm fortunate enough to be able to make a living doing something else. I was going to actually ask you later about A Single Man. I was going to ask you, I wasn't going to ask you if you're going to make any more films. I was going to yeah. tell you that you are going to make some more films. Well, thank at you. Least, at least quite a few more is there what is there should we talk about a single man now i'd love to talk you about can. a single man i'm gonna take this and put it away we'll just chat let's okay, talk we're just about you chat. don't you think we should talk about her look up let's talk about what, you no because no one has come here to talk about me All they've right. definitely come here to talk about tom ford with those legs they'll be talking about you okay well thanks thank you um okay a single man which i've actually watched probably about 74 times. I hope you cry. It's timeless. I cry and then I also feel very happy, very uplifted and very freed by the fact that that man realizes how powerless he is. Oh, it's such a paradox. Well, He's so powerless and yet... It's so many people tell me, and many of you um, probably have not seen this film, but so many people tell me that they find it such a depressing film. And for me, you know, this, ma- this man comes to peace with the world and understands his place in the world and really has that great epiphany that I, I think that some of us have sometimes for just a second where you feel really that you understand everything and that you're connected to the world. And when he has this, he leaves the world, he dies. He actually doesn't need to live any longer. He's learned the lesson of life. Uh, I mean, he could have another 20 or 30 years, but he doesn't actually need them. Nothing will ever equal that moment. So he dies at a moment of absolute self-understanding and realization. And so for me, that's a, quite an uplifting thought. Have you learned the lesson of life? As I said, it's fleeting. I have moments where, you know, just moments where you think, yes, and then you lose them. We lose them because of all the things that are happening in our lives. We lose them because of all the clutter and the chatter and, oh my God, it's time to go do this and I've got to do that and I've got to do that. And You know, I think uh, for me, someone who grew up in the the American West, I I like to think when I think, oh God, what do I want to be doing, you know, the last few years of my life, I'd really literally like to be watching ants crawl across the desert floor, looking at the stars and remembering and feeling connected to the universe. Because I think for me, it's very hard in a city uh, to feel that with all the distractions of of culture. And of course, with the speed at which we're living today, thanks to all of this culture, uh, we're living so quickly that... that, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know that we always feel connected, and I don't mean connected in an, in an, uh, 
a media way. In a, in a media way, how yes. do you stay connected? Can we just talk a little bit about because you? Well, you I are think such like everyone, I get up every morning and turn on my computer. It's just about the first thing I sleep with it. It's next to my bed, so immediately punk and you know see what happened overnight. And uh, like everyone, I, I am constantly on my computer. I right. do not carry normally a cell phone, except that there's a great. Uh, app that I have downloaded on my phone where I can watch uh, my son at sleep at night and so if I'm out to dinner I can make sure yes he's sleeping okay fine uh, and uh, but that's the only reason I this really carry a Jack. phone yes my yes. son Jack um, and do you are you reading newspapers magazines everything online for someone who's so visual are you still looking at print or are you I rarely changed? look at print because if I were to look at print I get on a plane with a big giant you know, bag full right. of magazines that I need to get through that I've been piling up on my desk. So no, actually I do look at most magazines online. Okay. On my iPad. And on your iPad. Um, so I just want to talk about all these images that we've seen. I don't think anyone realizes, but Tom actually shoots most of the campaign images himself. I didn't realize that. So I just want to put it out there because they're awesome. Is that something that you've done for a long time? I mean, obviously since Gucci and Yves Saint Laurent, you took it on with, went under your own brand. Is it something that you no, love doing? You know, it's it? Yeah, uh, I think that Today, with what one can do in Photoshop, almost anyone can be a great photographer if you have the eye to know what you want to turn that image into and the ability to sit there uh, with a Digitech and say, yes, no, do that and do that, let's try that, do that. Um, although some of it I like to do myself. Uh, and um, y yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, uh, I've worked with, I've been fortunate enough to work with really so many great photographers. I mean, photographers that are no longer with us and, and I think probably most of the greats. And, and so you learn so much being on a set for 30 years and watching how these people see what they do with the lighting. It's all about the lighting, which I don't know. Which let's but hope. But yes, it's let's optimist. hope. Let's we'll hope it's up to Mr. Four standards. We know when we'll, when we'll see but, it. But yeah. when you're shooting, when you're doing a single man and when you're shooting all your campaigns, is that, uh, for someone who has been called the ultimate controller, I have read. Well, I want to say something I about that because I think when someone comes and buys a product with your name on it, you should have done the product. It shouldn't be that somebody else did it and you say, yeah, that's great. It should be, that, no, that's not right. Change that, do that, put that there, that there, okay, that can have my name on it. So, of course, there is control to it. You know, design, uh, to create a brand with a character and personality, it's a dictatorship. It's not a committee decision. It doesn't mean you don't listen to everyone and take everything in, but then ultimately you have to weigh it and make the decision and say, okay, that's the way, that, that. And then so, yeah. That's you're doing that with menswear, womenswear, eyewear, beauty, fragrances. I am. Do you uh, sleep? I don't sleep very much, no. no. But I did that at, at Gucci, and I also, at one time for four years, designed both Gucci and Saint Laurent and went back and forth between Paris and, and London and Milan and Paris and London and Milan and Paris and London and Milan. Um, so I'm used to that sort of scale. I actually probably don't know how to do anything small. Okay, and, and you said, look, uh, it's been, you, you've said after that time that you needed, a re you were quite burnt out and you needed was, time to really, really reflect. Out. Yeah. So if there's periods in our life of acceleration and consolidation, for you now, would you say you're more in acceleration or it's time for, where are you at? God, I hope this is interesting to somebody. I don't know. Um, it's like, I met my therapist. Uh, well, it's interesting because I think I'm in a period of both. I, I think, you know, as one gets to a certain age, you're very aware of time and mortality and of taking moments in your life to enjoy things. And yet I'm in the middle of building a new business, which I'm very excited about. So my life is accelerating in that way, but I think I'm also maybe appreciating it and understanding it and enjoying it more than I did the first time around. Uh, I was having dinner with Karl Lagerfeld in my mid-30s and things had gone quite well very rapidly for me at Gucci and everything was really, you know, on its way up and I said, Karl, I, I, I just like, I don't feel anything. I don't feel any of this. It's just, I don't feel it. And he said, you will. You'll feel it later when you look back at it. And it's true. Now I look back at that time and I think, God, I didn't really feel it. I should have you know, felt it more. So I'm very aware of that today and of trying to feel everything that I do. It's very hard. But okay. All right. Um, Am talking I talking too much for you? No, not at all. You can just keep talking. I don't, I, I, I'll just listen and watch. Um, you, I wanted to talk about your recent show, talking about your name. The take us through. I want to talk about the the Jay Z song called Tom Ford, yeah. which is I Will don't want Molly. Us? I would look like such a prat. I want to see you I, slide I down I to the beat. 
I thought it was quite cool, but I beat. had to look up online what it actually meant. Anyway, it's drug related, well, so we won't go into it here. Well, do most of you know how to translate the lyrics of a rap song by a particular rap artist? Because they're all quite different depending on personal experiences in their lives. Um, do you know how to do that? Really? 100%? Uh, I didn't. So yeah, there, there are a couple of you know, rap translators online. There are quite a few. So uh, I don't pop Molly O'Rock Tom Ford has now become a, a, a global a global phenomenon, basically. The song by Jay-Z, he wore a t-shirt that wasn't actually a t-shirt by you. You went and put a, a dress in the collection that was a reference to that t-shirt. That's now gone global. It's one of the most recognized dresses, I think, in the world, and will probably stay like that for a long, long time. What's going on with that dress? Have you put it into production, or is that probably? Oh yeah, we have waiting lists for it. I'm sure. Um, well, first of all, it's an incredibly, it's again, the universe throws things at you. And uh, sometimes they're good, and sometimes they're bad. Uh, Jay-Z is someone I know. I think he's a great guy. Uh, we're friends. He's been wearing my clothes for years. He emailed me one day and said, you know, I'm writing a song called Tom Ford. And I thought, oh, okay, great. Uh, wow. And then waited. What came out, you I was quite really, surprised. Really well, of course, but I didn't necessarily believe it. You know, it, it's sort of, people say things all the time. And it, is it a joke? Is it not a joke? Then the song came out, and it wasn't what I expected. Uh, it was you know, I had to go on and line and see what it really meant. Uh, and the beat took me a little while. Uh, but it's one of those things, it's just so lucky. I mean, it's so lucky. How did it happen? Where did it come from? Why did he do it? But boom, there it is. And then you have these, the thing really freaks me out is when you're in a giant stadium and he performs it and there's 60,000 people screaming your name. It's really just, <laughs> just really like this. But it's, uh, it's one of those things. I have no idea why it happened, how it happened. But yeah, of course, if you're in the business of a brand, it's one of the best things that could possibly happen to you. And the universe just sort of threw that out there for me. It's amazing. It's amazing. When everyone's screaming your name, how does it feel? Now it I want to crawl under a rock because you I'm rock actually very, very, very shy. No one ever believes this. Uh, I can perform, uh, and this isn't necessarily a performance because I can do it fairly honestly, but I really am very shy. And uh, yeah. Okay, so when you're, when you're off, when you're away, when you're sitting at home on the sofa eating Percy Pigs, are you in? Like a monogram, Tom it's Ford true. shell suit. Are you kicking back? No. Are you in your dressing gown? No, What's the I am off probably in this same suit, which I will have picked up off the floor. And I don't believe that for a second, but anyway. No, no, it's really true. Um, I just, yeah, on the weekend or what? Yeah, just pick up my clothes Track from pants? where I left. No, I just pick up dirty whatever was okay. from the night before, yeah. There's a quote on... I used to spend most of my time at home naked. I'm not saying that's <laughs> anything cooler, great, or whatever. But now that I have a child, that means we have a nanny. That means I can't go downstairs naked and have a bowl of cereal in the morning. So I get dressed. Okay. Well, I'll that's a good clothes. thing for all of us. You can, we've, yeah, we, we, we know that you like naked by all your images. Naked is fine No, with no, us. no. You know, I mean, I think... I don't know, uh, especially why, if you're in the business... Naked, if you're in the business of... Well, someone told me the other day that that was... Uh, somebody asked in our office, oh, do you sleep in pajamas? And almost everyone said, yes. I said, that's so weird. I don't sleep in any clothes. And they said, oh, that's very American. You know, the English sleep with clothes on. And what, what are you talking about, the English sleep with clothes on? So the fact that you're asking me that question sort of makes me think, do you sleep with clothes on? I'm really English, and yes, I do. Ah. I don't know, you know, maybe it's because I'm in the business of clothes and fashion. I come home and, you know, before, as I said, before uh, I had a child running around, I just literally just took off all my clothes the moment I walked in the door and that was that. I don't know. Okay, so talking about the English, I wanted to ask you, and then we're going to open up for Q&A. By the way, I didn't wear a watch with this beautiful dress, so I have no idea what time it is. It's 7.30. Okay, so we have Q&A in a minute. So do you consider, you're living in London now, you are American, do you consider yourself a British designer? I know you show here for the women's well, wear I consider and myself wear. an international designer. I've never understood, I think, t to function in the world today, you have to think globally, and you think, you know, Global culture is more and more uh, united. There's still differences, but that used to drive me crazy living in France because everyone would always say, oh, how does it feel to be designing for Yves Saint Laurent, one of the great French uh, brands, and you're, Amer you're Texan. They didn't even call me American. You're Texan. And I, I used to find that sort of nationalism odd in today's world, I think. Uh, I designed for an international customer. Our customers can be Russian shopping in New York, can be Japanese shopping in LA, can be English shopping in Las Vegas, can be American shopping in London. I mean, we, we're, we're a global brand and I live that sort of life and, and I think increasingly that I, I'm an international designer, I think. 
Right, oh. and you have a hundred stores around the world, which is pretty amazing. Was there a morning when you woke up and thought, "I am gonna have the brand Tom Ford," or is that something? Has that been a plan for you a long, long time ago? I never thought I would do it, but being pragmatic, it was always in the back of my mind. And I realized even when I was at Gucci that one day I could not be there and that I better build a little equity in all the things that I was doing. And so I made sure that my name was out there associated with the brand. So that was a very conscious thing. And when I left uh, Gucci and Yves Saint Laurent, I thought, you know, I need to claim this. So I need to come out with a book, which was really the very first branded thing I did. I wasn't sure what I was going to do with it. I was just aware of the fact that I needed to put it over here in case I ever needed to fall back on it. And I don't mean literally the book. I mean, you know, claiming things I was very proud of that I had worked very hard uh, at. So, uh, yeah, I've always been very practical. But no, I never thought. I was very satisfied doing what I was doing at Gucci. Uh, and so I never intended to have my own company. Then, after I retired for three months, I got so bored that I realized, yeah, okay, I need to do this again. All right, well, don't retire again. Not yet, anyway. Um, we have so many people that we're going to have time for about five or six questions. If you would like to ask a question, raise your hand, and I or Tom will choose. Do you want to choose or I do? You it's up choose, to you. you choose. This is your show. Okay. Um, lady, just there, please. Um, I just wanted to know what was next for Tom Ford, the brand. You know, you've kind of done women's wear, men's wear, eyewear, beauty, and then you've got all your stores, you've launched um, online, tomford.com, kind of... What's next for you? Well, I think, first of all, we need to take a little bit of a breather and really consolidate because um, I think we're doing very well, but I think we can do better in all of the things that we do. And things are not, you know, they're never quite good enough for me and we're never quite there. Uh, so that's, that's the very next step. Although 100, in store, 100 stores is still not enough. But we're I gonna was going to say, how do you classify no, good no. enough in Tom Ford world, in the perfectionist world? What is good enough? I think good enough in anything is where you feel that you've given your best and you've said everything you have to say. And I don't feel there that I'm at that point yet. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, lady at the back there, please. Good evening, my name is Catherine. Hello, Catherine. Actually, there are two, hello. There are actually two questions. First one is, what is your why? What makes you wake up in the morning and do what you do, especially when you feel low? Because we all Compulsion. know Compulsion. I don't have any choice. You, you know, everyone has to live their destiny. I know you wanted to ask two, but I won't remember the first one if you go on to the second one. You, you, you have to be what you're going to be. You have to fulfill your destiny for whatever reason. This is just the way I am. I jump up and I start doing these things and I, I like building things. And as a kid, I liked building things. And what I'm building now is a brand. It's a, you know, but it is still building and it is a compulsion. I cannot help it. It is what I do. And uh, I've realized over time that it's also what makes me happy and that if I can't do it, I, I don't feel fulfilled. So it's a compulsion. Okay, next question. Um, a gentleman here, please, and then we'll come over to that side. A gentleman in the, no, sorry, this gentleman here in the black jacket. Hi, um, what Hello. do you want to do that you have not done yet? Oh, God, that's so hard. There's a lot of things that I want to do. Um, but I don't know that I can answer that because there's so many. I don't know. I mean, I'd love to make another movie. That's, that was the most fulfilling thing I've ever done in my life. And I had intended to make one every two or three years, hopefully for the rest of my life. But my uh, fashion company is growing so well. It's, I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining. Um, I, you can't complain. But uh, I would love to make more films. But, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, gentlemen here in the blue shirt, please. Blue shirt. First of all, um, I'd just like to say a big thank you to Kinvara. You always bring these incredible fashion icons to this incredible venue. And, thank uh, you. You did an amazing job of interviewing them, so well done. And Tom, you topped the list for that, thank so well thank done. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I'll pay you later. Uh, no worries. Yeah, just tenner. That's all I need. Hi, Tom. My name's uh, Mark Cameron. Hello, I'm, Mark. I'm launching a multi-brand fashion e-tailor in the UK and China later this year. Yeah. Um, my question for you is, you said last year to Vogue that you'd like Tom Ford to be the world's most successful luxury fashion company. Mm -hmm. um, how important is the Asian market to you in achieving that goal? And are you going to launch an e-commerce site in China as well? Because you've just launched one, haven't you? Yeah, we uh, will. Um, you know, you have to start and make sure everything's working before you start to... Uh, broaden your base uh, with e-commerce. So we've just launched that. Uh, and yes, of course, uh, you know, China's incredibly important to us. 
uh, in the future. We have uh, five stores in China at the moment. Actually, we might have more. Uh, if we don't, we're about to. And um, so it, it's an incredibly important market. But you, uh, as a multi-brand um, e-tailer, I asked probably the most famous multi-brand e-tailer this the other day at lunch, as now that monobrands are developing their business online so much, you know, what are you, well, obviously you're thinking about what you're going to do to make people want to go to your site when they can go to all the individual, uh, uh, it'll be interesting to see if multi-brand e-tailers go the way of American department stores, which of course have, you know, uh, uh, there's the less of them now than there were once because people go to monobrand stores, bricks and mortar. So I wonder if it will happen online. On that note, I just want to ask you, because I read that you were upset by how terrible some black items looked online compared to they do in store, which is quite well, interesting. I think it's a problem. It, it's interesting because our number one sales color in every single product we make is black. Most brands are. Uh, if you're making an investment and you're spending a lot of money on a beautiful handbag or beautiful pair of shoes, often you'll buy them in black. Uh, but design is changing so much because things are viewed online. And a black dress, even though it's beautiful in real life, doesn't necessarily read online, even for a shopper. So it pushes you as a designer to design things that you're even almost thinking, how is this going to look online? How will this photograph? And it's interesting because it is also altering, altering fashion because we're buying things that look good online. Now, when we get them home, you know, when they arrive, do they look good on us? I don't know. It's uh, just interesting because I, I love black. I could design in black because black for me is about sculpture. Sculpture, texture, fabric, shape. You, you lose color. So you just have the shape or the body of the fabric or the difference between satin and velvet or those, those textures. And so for me, that's very pure. It's very sculptural. But it's true. It doesn't photograph online as well as color, pattern, print, uh, other things. I find it interesting. I don't yeah. know what the a answer, about it or you know, I don't know what to say about it. But it's interesting. Well, if anyone's going to get it right on both, it, it's you because you're a great perfectionist. So let's see what you do. Thank okay. You. Next question. We have a gentleman here at the front, please. Um, what would be your um, main piece of style advice, um, particularly for like menswear? Never, ever, ever, man or woman, wear anything that you are remotely uncomfortable in. Doesn't matter if everyone's saying. It's all about this, it's all about that, it's all about this kind of shoe, it's all about that shoulder, it's all about the... D doesn't matter. If you put it on and it suits you and you feel good in it, that's one thing. Never ever be uncomfortable in your clothes because that's what you will project. You just project, I look like a fool. <laughs> Even if you don't because you think, oh, I don't feel good in this. And you'll project that. You'll be tentative, you'll be uh, not, not your best. So never ever wear anything you're not comfortable in. And I don't mean physical comfort. I don't mind suffering a little bit. High, high heels. A corset, maybe. You don't mind suffering because you're not wearing My the high heels. My pants are pretty tight today because I've been eating too many Percy's pigs. But, uh, yes. But on, but on the thing of that you're not suffering, but, but actually women are suffering in their high heels. I mean, it, it's different for men. I would just like to fight well, our corner. Well, you don't have to wear them, but I bet that you still will. Yeah, we still will. We still will. If they look like this, then we will. Will you quickly talk about the London men's collection? Because that's a really big deal for London, that Dylan Jones, editor of GQ, and a, a quite a group of you have really come together and have made menswear in London a, a really major thing. That's a huge achievement and a big deal for London. Why did you choose to do that? Well, first of all, I live here. Uh, my design studio is here. Uh, I have a child I don't necessarily want to leave and go to uh, Italy for a few days for. However, something bigger than that, which is that men's style today is derived from a, an Anglo, uh, traditionally Anglo, Anglophile style. It was different in the late 70s, early 80s. Armani had such a pull for menswear that things became softer, drapier, and uh, were less Anglophile. But today's fashion for men is really all about a certain shoulder and certain things that were developed throughout history uh, in this country, mostly as uniforms. Uh, and, and so there is a certain link between, between English classical style and contemporary men's fashion. And the, the workmanship too here and the eccentricity, you know, one of the things that I love about, about being here, well, the, the main reason I live here, the people, and the fact that eccentricity 
in fashion and in everything is celebrated. Um, and it isn't necessarily celebrated in some places. And here it is. And men have been peacocks for so long. You have a history of that. You go back to Beau Brummel. You have a, a history of loving, you know, men loving style and feeling confident and, and holding themselves up and, and really wearing fashion, wearing clothes. And I, I love that. Well, I arrogantly speak for the whole of England when I say that it's a really real, it's, it's a big deal for us to have you and your, and your collection here and your support because that's, it's such a big thing for British fashion, so it's great. Hi there. Um, I wanted to ask about movies, actually, because mm. I love movies and I think uh, Single Man is probably one of the best movies I've ever seen, to be honest. Thank you. And I'm hoping that you're going to do any, a few more hopefully. Um, is there any plan? Are you planning to do that? Yes, um, and I have a few that I could do if I had the time to shoot them. But uh, yes, definitely. I will be very sad if uh, I don't make more films. You don't yeah. have to co-write them, produce them and direct them this time. You could just do one of those things. Well, I don't know. You know, one reason that I loved working on that film so much was that it was quite a singular expression. Um, I didn't have to listen to someone say, you know, I think if you change the ending and we cut that, you know, I didn't have to have someone say, well, you're running out of time, you've editing too long, we're going to pull the budget. You know, I was able to just do what I felt was right. So that, that is the thing that comes with that. But you still work with a great group of people. I mean, I had wonderful collaborators around me uh, uh, for that film. I, um, I didn't realize Thank that the, the design team were the people who worked on Mad Men for that movie, or have I read that wrong on the internet? The guy who did our uh, sets yes. had been doing the Mad had Men Had been doing sets. Mad Men. Yeah. And is your home like that set? Not at all. Not at all. No, but I also believe each house... Uh, sorry, your, is, that's made your me really toys? sounds boiled, each house. Um, <laughs> when I'm in New Mexico, I want to feel like I'm in New Mexico. So my house there is made of adobe, and the furniture is classical. You know, there's a, a, a feeling to it, and my house in Los Angeles is very LA and my house in London's very English seriously and it, are your child's toys laid out neatly mm, in the nursery he in lays rows? them out it's so genius he's so organized really I don't know where it came from I don't know where it <laughs> came from so great oh well that's good then he's not gonna get told off okay we have time for one I more question I wouldn't tell him off anyway um, it's his life his thing you choose the last person oh god I'm going again here for bright yellow online. Yellow with the cool jumper. That's you. You're, you're looking around for the mic. <laughs> Thank you very much. I just wanted to ask, what would be your definition of luxury and what does it mean to you? Sleep, 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 sleep. Just a great bed and just sleeping. And you know what would be great? Not a single email. No emails. Sleep. <laughs> okay, well on that note, we're going to wrap up. We're going to leave you here. You're going to watch Tom's latest fall 2014 show. Before you do that... A lot of it's black. It won't look as good online as it did in real life. It'll look good. Mm. I just want to say a really, really big thank you so much thank to you. Tom Ford for thank joining you. us. Thank you so Thanks. much. You've thank been you. You're great. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>